So last time we talked about uh, using vectors to uh, locate ourselves in the physical world and to represent uh, any quantities that are uh, that have a magnitude and a direction. So position is certainly one, but um, but there are other things like velocity, for example, which is what we're going to be talking about today, that uh, that are vectors. So let's just quickly, before we launch into this, review a little bit what we learned about vectors. Um, we're going to do this in two dimensions for simplicity. So if we have uh, a simplicity, meaning I can draw in two dimensions, but I can't draw in three. Um, so we have a Cartesian coordinate system. <clears throat> With axes like this, this is going to be the x-axis plus x goes to the right, the y-axis plus y goes up, and the z-axis, which I'm not drawing, comes, comes out of the page toward you again, our right-handed coordinate system. <laughs> So suppose we have two vectors. So we have a vector A that's equal to 3, 4, 0. And so that means that starting at the, we're going to draw it starting at the origin. We're going to go three units in the x direction and one, two, three, four units up in the y direction. And so that's going to be our vector A. And we have another vector B, which is equal to negative 5, negative 2, 0. So that would mean it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units in the negative x direction and 2 units in the negative y direction. So that's, that's our vector B. <clears throat> These could represent the position of two objects relative to the origin. Um, then there are various things we can do with these. We can add A and B. So if we add A plus B, we just add the components. So that would be 3, 4, 0 plus negative 5, negative 2, 0. And that equals negative 2, 2, 0. And graphically, we would do this by redrawing the vectors so that the, the tip of one is at the tail of the other. So if I draw my vector A kind of like that, and then I'm going to move the vector B so its tail starts at at the tip of A. So there's our vector B. And the resultant vector, which I'm going to draw from the tail of A to the tip of B, is going to be A plus B. So we have two ways. That doesn't, not very readable. Sorry, A plus B. So we have two ways to represent this sum. One is by manipulating the components mathematically, and the other is by adding them graphically. We can also subtract vectors. So if we said a minus b, that would be 3, 4, 0. Here, let's write that more clearly. 3, 4, 0 minus negative 5, negative 2, 0, which would equal uh, 8, 2, 0. And to do this graphically, we would put the vectors tail to tail, uh, as they are actually drawn in the diagram. So we'd have, here's A and There's B, and since we said um, 
Let's make this a little... Okay, so we said A minus B. That means that the tip of A is going to be the final location of our resultant vector, and the tip of B is going to be the start of our resultant vector. So we'll draw our vector A minus B like that. 860. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is 860. And we can check that because... <clears throat> um, thank you. So 860, because we can see that the, the vector A minus B goes a fairly long, long ways in the, in the plus X direction. So much longer than two. So we have a, a sort of way to make meaning out of it. <clears throat> Yeah, if I make a mistake, please correct it. Because sometimes I think ahead of what I'm doing at the moment. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so we also have here, um, <clears throat> We have some other things we can do to a vector. We can find the magnitude of a vector, which basically, as we talked about last time, is its size, how big it is. And the magnitude of the vector A, we just use the Pythagorean theorem. So it would be three square root of three squared plus four squared plus zero squared. And the Z coordinate will not always be zero. And so that's five. <coughs> And we can also make a unit vector in the direction of A. We call it A hat. And if we drew it um, on our coordinate system here, it would look something like this. It would be parallel to A, but it would only be one unit long, although unit vectors, slightly paradoxically, don't actually have units. Um, <clears throat> That's defined as the vector A divided by the magnitude of A. And this invokes scalar multiplication. So we're multiplying by the scalar one over A or one fifth here. And so that's three, four, zero divided by five. And that gives us the unit vector 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0. And if these were ve position vectors, so they had units of meters, we'd see that the units canceled. And so the unit vector has no units. Now, one way you can identify a unit vector and make sure you've got a good one is that none of the components can be greater than one. If something's greater than one, then its magnitude is going to be greater than one and it's not a unit vector. So all of its components need to be smaller than one. And we can write the vector A as the product of its magnitude which is five and it's unit vector a hat. So it's equal to, so we're basically factoring the vector B A. So this is magnitude. This is unit vector. And this is factoring a vector. So we can write A is five times this unit vector 0 0.6, 0 0.8, zero. And that gives us, in fact, the vector we started with, because 5 times 0.6 is 3, 5 times 0.8 is 4, and 0. So factor a vector. <clears throat> now, a useful thing, so that's what we did last time. A useful thing to know that we didn't do last time, because you asked such great questions that we didn't get there, is that it is possible to relate uh, 
angles and unit vectors. So angles and unit vectors. So if we have these three axes, and this time I'm going to draw the z axis coming out of the board here, then if we have some vector um, b, uh, please use decimals. And so your question is, is it better to use fractions or decimals in, in unit vectors? Please use decimals. Um, you're going to need to do that in the online homework anyway. So, um, and yes, they're not going to be exact always. You're going to end up truncating a little bit. So this vector makes some, some angle with the x-axis, which we're going to call theta sub x, and it makes an angle with the y-axis, which we'll call theta sub y, the plus, we're always talking about the plus y-axis here. And it also makes an angle with the z-axis here, which we're going to call theta sub z, and in this case that angle is 90 degrees because this vector is in the xy plane. So let me... Um, show you actually an example of this. Oh, well, let me, before I switch screens here, let me tell you what the point of this is. So the point is that the unit vector B hat, so the unit vector in the direction of B, can be written as the cosine of theta sub x, y component is cosine of theta sub y, and the z component is the cosine of theta sub z. So, and this way, this is called, they're called direction cosines. It's the angle to the, to the, to the positive x, positive y, or positive z axis, and theta x uh, or theta y or theta z are always uh, positive and they're less than or equal to 180 degrees. So you take the, the small, the, the short way around. Um, we won't need this terribly often, uh, but we will need it sometimes. <clears throat> Uh, radians or degrees, um, we'll use both. Uh, you'll just make sure you, you know which you're using on your calculator. Uh, so if an angle's given in, we'll make it clear what we're asking for, whether we're asking for an angle in degrees or radians. Uh, but we'll go back and forth between degrees and radians. So vectors, what can we do with vectors? Well, <clears throat> We can use them to measure positions or to find a relative position of one thing to another, but velocity is also a vector. So here's a question for you. So you, suppose you travel at a speed of five meters per second for 10 seconds. <clears throat> How far away are you from your starting point? So, um, so here's a pole. You traveled at five meters per second for 10 seconds. How far are you from your starting location? Okay, so some of you have, are, are discussing the right thing. So the majority said 50 meters, but some people said, 20% uh, said any of the above is possible. And they are actually 
correct because precisely because we didn't say anything about directions. So you could have started here and of course distance is uh, speed times time as you've all known since fourth grade. You could have started here and gone in a straight line and gotten to here and indeed you would be 50 meters <coughs> away from away from your starting point however if the direction did vary you could actually have traveled along a 50 meter circle and ended up back at your starting point <clears throat> so what we asked for in the question was how far are you from your starting point we asked for is is displacement basically displacement <clears throat> and displacement is how far you are from something else so that's if you started at some position r initial and you ended up at some position r final you would your displacement would be delta r now we're often going to use the symbol delta here this is the the capital greek delta it means a change in something or a difference so our displacement from our starting point is a vector and in this case delta r would be that vector and so the magnitude of delta r which is a distance would be 50 meters but in this case um, here we have r final is exactly the same as r initial and so delta r is r final minus r initial which is the vector zero 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 so the magnitude of delta r is zero and it could be anything in between you could have you could have uh walked this way for a while and walked that way for a while you could have done many things so in order to really talk clearly about about motion and displacement we need to be more specific than just giving a speed we actually need to give a velocity. So instead of uh, distance is speed times time, what we're going to write here is velocity. We're going to say that the displacement of an object is equal to the average velocity times the elapsed time. So here delta t is going to be t2 minus t final minus t initial. I guess that's the um, elapsed time. So the symbol delta can be used both with a vector and a scalar. And the average so this actually gives us a definition of average velocity so average velocity so v average is going to be equal to our vector displacement divided by the amount of time elapsed That's, yeah, Melinda, that's a good question. If the question is, if the question was, how far did it travel? The answer, the answer would be 50 meters. Um, how, what is its speed? 50 meters per second. But how far away is it from where it started? That's a question about displacement. And that may or may not be 50 meters, just depending on. So. So here we've got delta r 
involves, so here's the first case where we really need to use vector subtraction. So delta r, the change in position, is a vector. And if we started here at this location relative to some origin, so that's r initial, and we ended up at some other location relative to the origin r final, then our displacement, and you can now see why vector subtraction is starts at the, the initial location and goes to the final location, our displacement delta r would be the vector from our starting location to our final location, and that that is indeed the subtraction. So delta r here is r final minus r initial. <clears throat> now how does the direction of delta r relate to the direction of our average velocity? Well, this vector equation actually has direction information in it. Because if one vector is equal to another vector, they're equal in magnitude and direction. So that tells us that the average velocity direction is actually has to be the same as the direction of our displacement delta r. <clears throat> and so well, what about this delta t? Well, the delta t is going to be a positive number since, at least in this course, we are always moving forward in time, never backwards in time. So t final minus t initial is always going to be a positive number. And multiplying a vector by a positive number can, can make it positive scalar, can make it larger or, or shrink it, but it can't change its direction. To change the direction of any of the components, you need to be multiplying by a negative number. So, so these directions have to be the same, and this vector equation tells us that. Now, the average velocity um, is not necessarily is is useful is a useful thing. Um, most useful if the instantaneous velocity doesn't change very much during the, the time interval delta t. So in this case here, if we start at location A and, and move to location, start at loca the initial location and move to the final location, this average velocity, V average delta R over delta t, is a good reflection of what happened during that interval if we went more or less in a straight line at constant speed, if our actual path did that, then at any point our velocity would, would almost never have been what the average velocity is. Now what is our velocity on a curving path? Suppose we're walking along we move along some path like that. So here's our initial location, and here's our final location. When we're, when we're here, say, what is our velocity? Well, our velocity is a vector, our instantaneous velocity. And so our instantaneous velocity is going to be as, at this moment, it's a straight line, V, instantaneous <clears throat> and here our velocity would be like that and here our velocity would be like that and here it's like that so our instantaneous velocity is not necessarily going to be the same as our average velocity which 
our average velocity is going to end up being in that direction. So we're going to get a V average in that direction. However, in the longer we take our delta t time interval, the worse an approximation that's going to be. But the smaller and smaller we take delta t, um, the instantaneous velocity is going to be a lot closer to the average velocity. So if we did take that circular path, as in our, our first example, where we started at a location and went around a circle, when we were at this location, what would the direction of our instantaneous velocity be? Well, it's tangent to the circle, and since we're going clockwise, it would be like that. So as delta t goes to zero, the average approaches the instantaneous velocity. Well, it is, it's not only like a derivative, uh, Richard, it, it is a derivative, right? So as so we can write it as V instantaneous is the limit as delta T goes to zero of delta R over delta T. So it's the limit as delta T goes to zero of V average. <clears throat> So basically that's dr dt. Now, what, how do you take a derivative of a vector? Well, so v is equal to dr dt, which is equal to dx dt, dt sorry, <clears throat> dy dt, dz dt, and so that would be basically the x component of the velocity, the y component of the velocity, and the z component of the velocity. Well, what can we do with velocity, and in particular, the average? Well, we can predict new positions. So, um, so we can use average velocity to predict where something's going to be in the future. So we're, we have a crystal ball, we're predicting the the motion of a system into the future. And as long as we know the average velocity or good approximation for it over some interval delta t, we can predict a new position. So we're going to write, rewrite the equation that defined average velocity is, is this equation. We're going to say r in the future is r now plus v average delta t. We're going to call this the position update equation. This is future. And it's one of a very small number of equations that you will need to memorize in this class, but this is one of them. Well, so suppose that your velocity, so the question is, how do you relate this to, <clears throat> to variables? Well, it depends on whether the velocity is a function of time or not. So um, if you're traveling at, at constant velocity, for example, you were traveling five, zero, zero meters per second, <clears throat> that would be good. If, it, if, if V as a function of T was six times T, 
zero, zero meters per second, then you could use a derivative. <clears throat> but let's see what we can just do with average velocities here. So let's consider a problem uh, that involves a physical system. So suppose we have a branch of a tree here, a twig, and we've got two spiders um, at the ends of the twig. So here's one spider and there's another spider. So we're gonna call this one spider one and we're gonna call this one spider two. And this twig is three meters above the ground. So here's the ground. And this distance is three meters. <clears throat> well, we can ask lots of questions about this. <clears throat> We can ask questions like, um, like where will, no, oh, we need to know velocities, okay? So let's, and we need to know positions. So spider one uh, will give it a velocity, an average velocity, of zero, negative 0 0.010 meters per second. <clears throat> its location up here is negative point, negative, negative 0 0.530 meters. <clears throat> the ground is gonna be at y equals zero. And it's gonna, it's gonna travel at a constant velocity. So V average is equal to V instantaneous. We could ask questions like, where will spider one be in 20 seconds? We could ask, how long will it take it to reach the ground? We can say where location on the what's what will its location on the ground be? <clears throat> and we can we can use these. So this isn't this is not none of this is a hard problem. Okay. So we can. So we have our location, our, our equation, our final is our initial plus V average delta T. So to find out where it's gonna be in 20 seconds, we just plug 20 seconds in here. We know the average velocity and we can find its position. Um, how long does it take to reach the ground? Well, uh, we have the average equals delta R over delta T. So we know its final position. So we could, it's pretty tempting to write delta T equals delta R over V average. Why can't we do that? Yep, that's exactly right, Claire. We can't divide by a vector. So as tempting as that is, that's not an equation we can write. Can't have a vector in the denominator. But this vector equation here is really actually Three, equa three separate component equations written conveniently as one thing. So this really reduces to x final equals x initial plus v average x 
delta t. And y final equals y initial plus v average y delta t. And z final equals z initial plus v average z delta t. <clears throat> and we can take, okay, this isn't going to be very helpful because the change in x is going to be is going to be zero. X final is equal to X initial because V average X delta T is zero. And V average Z delta T is zero, but V average Y is not. So we can use this one and say, uh, we can rearrange this equation. So we can say Y final minus y initial uh, is v average y delta t, so y final minus y initial divided by the y component, which is a scalar, is going to be equal to delta t. So we have, when it reaches the ground, it's going to be at zero meters. It started at a height of three meters and its average speed was um, negative, aver the, it's at the, the y component of its average velocity was negative 0 0.01 meters per second, so one centimeter per second. And we have a negative three divided by a negative 0 0.01, so, and we have meters per second meters divided by meters per second, so our units come out to seconds, so we have, it should take 300 seconds. Okay, that was not very hard. However, a more interesting question would be if we add spider two moving in a slightly different direction. So here's our twig. We have spider one, we have spider two, and spider one is at negative 0 0.530 uh, meters. Spider two is at uh, zero three zero meters. Spider one has the same initial, same average velocity we gave it, so its average velocity v1 is going to be equal to z zero minus 0 0.010 meters per second. But the velocity of spider two is actually going to be at an angle. This, so this spider is going down a strand of web descending along a strand of web to the ground here at a constant speed. And this, this spider's web strand goes straight down, but this spider is descending along a web that goes like that. So its velocity, its average velocity, has an X component. And in fact, it's going seven millimeters a second in the X direction and minus 0 0.01 meters per second in the Y direction and zero in the Z direction. <clears throat> so now we can ask a question. <clears throat> uh, which spider is gonna reach the ground first? Uh, is spider one going to reach the ground first or is spider two going to reach the ground first or are they going to reach the ground at the same time? Here's what you said. We're pretty divided. So 50% said spider one, 
20% said spider two, 30% said they'll reach the ground at the same time. So let's see, uh, we, we definitely are not in total agreement. Let's see if we can figure this out using physics. So we, we already figured out how long it's gonna take spider one to reach the ground, it's 300 seconds. So we did this by looking at this, this y equation and finding out when y would become zero. So if we do this for spider two, we find that we're gonna write y final minus y initial is v average y delta t for spider two. <coughs> And gosh, this equation is gonna look just the same as it did for spider one, because we have its final location is zero meters. It started out at three meters. Um, it's equal to V average Y, which is negative 0 0.01 meters per second delta T. So we're going to get again that delta T is 300 seconds. Orange is just the majority. So physics here predicts that spider two should actually reach the ground at exactly the same time as spider one. But what about this X component of velocity here? The Y components of velocity are the same for, for both of these spiders, we have negative 0 0.01 meters per second in the y direction. The x component here is different though. And so we have to ask ourselves, can an x component of velocity affect displacement in the y direction? And the answer is no, it can't. Because this vector equation, tell, these vector equations tell us that, that what happens in the y direction depends only on the y component of the average velocity. And the x component is independent. Now, it is true that spider two is going faster, isn't it? Because the magnitude of the, the average velocity of spider one is 0 0.01 meters per second. Remember, magnitude's a positive number. The magnitude of the velocity of spider two is gonna be the square root of 0 0.007 squared plus minus 0 0.01 squared. And it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be greater than 0 0.01 meters per second, but it's going farther. So in fact, um, it moves faster, but it goes farther. So the correct answer is they get there at the same time. And physically that's because the Y component of their average velocity is exactly the same. Now, how far apart are they gonna be when they hit the ground? We can do this analytically but I'd like to show you how to do this with a computational model. And to do this, um, I want to show you, uh, I'm gonna write a model with you, but first I'm gonna show you something about how a computational model works. And so what this is, is a vPython program that, uh, that talks about how repeated calculations work. And in particular, it talks about variables and something, a construct called a loop where you do the same calculation over and over again. Why is that important? Because what we're gonna be doing in a computational model in our simple computational model that we're gonna to build together is using the position update equation over and over again, taking small time steps in order to predict um, 
predict what's happening. And so I want to show you this in a very simple case, uh, just so we can, we'll all be on the same page about how this is actually working. So over here at the left, at the top of the screen where my cursor is, we have a little program written in a computer language called Python. And what we're going to do is sort of animate how the computer executes this program. And the computer is going to go through, as computers do executing code, these instructions. One, every, every line is an instruction telling the computer to do a calculation. And the computer is just going to go through them in order one at a time and do what it's told. It's not very smart. So the first thing it's told is to, to set uh, A equals 5. Well, the computer, so what does that mean for a computer? The computer said, well, says, well, you gave me a number 5, and you told me that you want a variable named A. And I don't have a variable. Why is it a variable? Because its value can change during a computation. So what I'm going to do is the central processing unit, which is the brain, says, well, I have to create this variable called A because I don't already know about it. So what I'm going to do is find a location in my memory, and I'm going to store that number 5 in that location, and then I'm going to give it a tag saying A so that the next time somebody says, I want to know what A is, I will be able to go to that location and find a value. <clears throat> oh, Marco, we're not working with, with gravity because the spiders aren't falling. They're going down a web. And so, so they're going down a web strand, and so they're crawling at a constant speed. Okay, so the computer did that line, and now it says, we have an instruction that says A equals A plus 3. So A equals A plus 3 is something your algebra teacher probably would have told you is an impossible equation. But it isn't really an equation. What an equal sign means in a computer program is something different. What an equal sign means in a computer program is set something. So you read this, set the value of A to, on the right-hand side, we're going to find the current value of A and add 3 to it. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to take this value 3, the computer is going to retrieve the current value of A, and it's going to overwrite the current value of A with the new value, which is now 8. So it doesn't know anything about that 5 anymore. That's gone. Now the value of A is, is 8. <clears throat> Next, we're going to make a B that's, that's 10. <clears throat> and now we're going to say, <clears throat> set the value of A to the current value of A plus the current value of B. So it has to read those values from memory, add them, and then store them back into A. So it reads up 8 plus 10, we get 18, and it overwrites what's in A. So A is now 18 and B is 10. So that's how variables work on a computer. If we tell it B is 1, it now says, I don't care what used to be in B, now it's 1. We can also create variables that have names that are bigger, larger than, longer than one character, which is extremely useful when we're doing physics. So we're going to create a variable called sum and initialize it to set its value to zero. Now we get to a very interesting structure, which is going to be the key of everything we're going to do in physical computation. We say while something is true, while a logical expression is true, while b is less than 4, if B is less than four, then the computer is told to do, is going to execute these lines that are indented here one at a time over and over again until B is not less than four. This is called a loop because it's going to loop back. So the first thing it has to decide is, is B less than four? It knows that B is now one, one is less than four, so it's going to go to the next line. What we're supposed to do is sum 
the computer is supposed to set the value of sum to sum plus b, and this program wants us to enter a value for uh, what that's going to be. Well, I think it's going to be 1 because sum is currently 0 and b is 1, so I believe it's going to be 1. I'm going to type 1 in this box and press enter, and it says I'm right. So 0 plus 1 is 1, and it puts a 1 into sum. Now, in the real world, we don't have x-ray vision like we do in this program, so we can't see what's in a computer memory, so it's useful to ask the computer to print something out for us. So we have, we ask it to read up what's in B and what's in sum and print those out for us. And it did that in our little output area. And now we're gonna add one to the current value of B. So we'll read up the value of B, add one to it and put it back. Now we've finished the indented lines. So the next thing that happens is we go back to this while statement and the computer has to check to see if b is less than four. Well, is two less than four? Yes. So good, we're gonna go on and do these indented lines again. So we're gonna make sum equals sum plus b. And what should I type in this box for what the new value of a sum is gonna be after, we, after it executes this line? Okay, you think I should type three, so I'll type three. And that turned out to be correct. And now sum is set to three, we're gonna add one to B. Oh, we're gonna print, sorry. Now we're gonna print the current values of B and sum. And so B is now two and sum is three. And now we're gonna add one to B. and go on. Three is still less than four. So we've looped back to the beginning again. Three is still less than four. Now what should I type for what the new value of sum is gonna be if we add, if we do sum, set the value of sum to its sum plus b, six. Okay, I think it's six, I'll type six. Looks like six is correct. <clears throat> And we're gonna print these things. So we print the current values. We add one to B. And now we go back, we loop back to the while statement, but now is four less than four? Nope. So we're done. We stop indent executing indented lines and we just print the last line. So that's how variables and loops work in computers. Now what we're gonna do here is we are going to write a computer model of our spiders. And we're gonna ask the, uh, ask the computer to model the motion of our spiders. So let's create a new program. We'll call it spiders. And, okay. So let me make the font a little bigger. Okay, so we need a twig to represent the branch, it's a cylinder. Its position is a vector negative 0 0.530 because it's above the ground. It goes, it extends from its position a distance of 0 0.500 and it has a radius of 0 0.5 and here this is all in meters. Okay, so we made a cylinder to represent a twig. Whoa, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look even remotely like, um, ah. I want it to be smaller. There we go, there's our twig. 
And we need the ground. Zero, zero, let's make it green. We'll make it not very thick. We'll make it three meters wide and seven meters long. So here's the twig and here's the ground. I'm going to do something a little fancy and move the camera so that we, we can see this all a little bit better. So I'm going to say, that, tell the computer that the center of the scene is at, um, is at 0, 1.50. And all that does is just move the camera. OK, now we need spiders. So I'm going to type S1 for spider1. And I'm just going to make it a sphere. Its position is uh, the same as the left end of the cylinder. It's, it's going to be magenta because it's clearly a radioactive spider. And it has a radius of uh, 0 0.1, so about 10 centimeters, because it's really big. And I'm going to ask it, to, since it's going to move, so here it is. There's our magenta spider. Since it's going to move, I'm going to ask it to leave a trail so we can see what's happening. So I'm going to say, make trail is true. I want it to leave a trail in, in points, so trail type is point and I want it to leave uh, a dot every 10 steps. <clears throat> okay, and spider two is gonna be pretty much the same except it's going to be at the other end of the twig, which is x equals 0, and we'll make it orange. OK. And since we're running out of time, let me just grab a copy of this program. Um, <clears throat> the rest of the program and explain it to you. So here's our delta T and here's our while loop. Here's a calculation we're gonna do. So this just slows it down so we can see it. But here's our position update equation. R1 is the old value of, so R final is our initial plus V1 delta T for spider two. Its new position is its old position plus V average two delta T. We're gonna increment delta T and then we're just gonna print out stuff. Where's the spider? So here's our little loop. And that's the whole, the whole thing. We're just using the position update equations. So let's just run it and see what happens. Oops. OK, I made a typing error. That's because the program I copied this from used spider1, but here I used s1. Okay, and I forgot to copy the velocities, so it would actually really help to have the velocities. We better have those. <clears throat> okay, so we have the same velocities we had in the problem. We have the position update equation, and we're gonna watch what happens. Uh, 
Okay, my print doesn't work because I have the same reason. Okay, so we're going to stop the loop when spider one hits the ground. And finally it runs. And we see that it does take them the same amount of time to get to the ground. But a nice thing about this is we also know how far apart they are because we have their final X positions printed out for us. You can see the final Y position. There was a little rounding error. It's not quite zero. Um, and here's the vector delta R between the two spiders and they're 2.6 meters apart. So I'm sorry that we've, oh, we're not quite out of time, are we? Okay. So we have four minutes. So I'm sorry that went by sort of fast, but let's look at what we did here. So we defined the initial positions of our spiders. Here we define their average velocities to be what we had in the problem. Here we decided to take a time step of one second and set t to zero. Scene.pause, that just waits for a mouse click. And then our loop condition was we'd keep running until the Y component of spider one's position was, was just greater than zero. This is a rounding error thing also. And what we used is our position update equation. So this is the final position of spider one uh, the, is for every little time step, we stepped one step at a time. The final position is equal to the initial position plus the average velocity times delta t. And notice that v1 is a vector here. So we're doing vector algebra here. We're doing scalar multiplication. And so it not only confirms our conclusion that they would take the... Uh, take the same time, but as a bonus, it actually tells us how far apart they are, which would have been a kind of a com more complicated problem to solve analytically. What rate does just tells us to slow down this loop uh, enough so that it, we can see it. If I make it really, really fast, um, it'll run a lot faster. So it's just how many times what it is is rate 100 means do go through this loop 100 times a second, but not more. No, it's not frames per second. It's frames per second here is just going to be 60 because that's what VPython does. But it's, it's uh, how many times through the loop each second. Loops per second, that's right. Okay, so what's going to happen with this? Um, in lab next week, you will work with this program. So you'll get this program, you will modify it to, you'll get some questions to answer and you'll have to make little modifications to the program to answer some questions. 